As first perceived, the outward strangeness of things in Japan produces a queer thrill impossible to describe, a feeling of weirdness which comes to us only with the perception of the totally unfamiliar. The houses are constructed and furnished in ways alien to all your experience. You are astonished to find that you cannot conceive the use or meaning of numerous things on display in the shops. Foodstuffs of unimaginable derivation, utensils of enigmatic forms, emblems incomprehensible of some mysterious belief, strange masks and toys that commemorate legends of gods or demons. Everywhere on signs and hangings, you will observe wonderful Chinese characters, and the wizardry of all these texts make the dominant tone of the spectacle. The delicate perfection of workmanship, the light strength and grace of objects, the power manifest to obtain the best results with the least material, the achieving of mechanical ends with the simplest possible means, the comprehension of irregularity as aesthetic value the sense displayed of harmony in tints or colors, all this must convince you at once that our Occident has much to learn from this remote civilization, not only in matters of art and taste, but in matters likewise of economy and utility. As the outward strangeness of Japan proves to be full of beauty, so the inward strangeness appears to have its charm, an ethical charm, reflected in the common life of the people. Everybody greets each other with happy looks and pleasant words. Faces are always smiling. The commonest incidents of everyday life are transfigured by a courtesy at once so artless and so faultless that it appears to spring directly from the heart without any teaching. Under all circumstances, a certain outward cheerfulness never falls. Religion brings no gloom into this sunshine. Before the Buddhas and the gods, folk smile as they pray. The temple courts are playgrounds for the children, and within the enclosure of the great public shrines, which are places of festivity as well as solemnity, dancing platforms are erected. Of course, the conditions of which I speak are now passing away, but they are still to be found in the remoter districts. Japanese civilization is peculiar to a degree for which there is perhaps no western parallel, since it offers us the spectacle of many successive layers of alien culture superimposed above the simple indigenous basis and forming a bewilderment of complexity. The peculiar fact is that, in spite of all superimposition, the original character of the people and of their society should still remain recognizable. The wonder of Japan is not to be sought in the countless borrowings with which she has clothed herself. Much as a princess of the olden time would don twelve ceremonial robes of diverse colors and qualities, folded one upon the other so as to show their many tinted edges at throat and sleeves and skirt. No, the real wonder is the wearer. For the interest of the costume is much less in its beauty of form and tint than in its significance as idea, as representing something of the mind that devised or adopted it. And the supreme interest of the old Japanese civilization lies in what it expresses of the race character and that character which yet remains essentially unchanged by all the changes of the Meiji. Suggests is perhaps a better word than expresses, for this race character is rather to be divined than recognized. Ethnologists are agreed that the Japanese race has been formed by a mingling of peoples, and that the dominant element is Mongolian. Thus much can only be safely affirmed. The Japanese race, like all good races, is a mixed one and that the peoples who originally united to firm it have been so blended together as to develop, under long social discipline, a tolerably uniform type of character. Japan has entered into the world's competitive struggle, and the worth of any people in that struggle depends upon character quite as much as upon force. We can learn something about Japanese character if we are able to ascertain the nature of the conditions which shaped it the great general facts of the moral experience of the race, and these facts we should find expressed or suggested in the history of the national beliefs, and in the history of those social institutions derived from and developed by religion.